Actually, Welcome everyone. Thanks. Sorry for the little bit of delay there. We have a new camera. We're just trying to try it out here. Uh, my name is Brett Bixler. I'm the lead instructional designer with Education Technology Services. Can you hear me in the back? I need to speak up more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This this new uh, air conditioning system makes it a little bit difficult. So if my voice fades or the voice of my colleagues fades, just let me know. Uh, I'm here today with Bart Purcell from IST and Chris Stubbs are also part of this initiative that we've named the Educational Gaming Commons at Penn State. Uh, we started this, it's been a while ago, I mean we conceptualized it, I'm going to say at least two years ago, we started talking about it and talking about it. And so we're here today with a whole bunch of things that we've done that we want to show you and we tried to figure out ways to make this interactive and we thought we'd you know, make you fight for pizza but didn't think that was such a good idea. So we do have a game that we want to show you that, that's a work in progress and uh, towards the end of the presentation then, Bart's going to bring that up and we'll, we'll show it to you. It's a, a really neat game called Eco Racer, which is about uh, learning about alternative fuel sources and, and making intelligent decisions about, about using fuel. So, without further ado, why, why should we even do this? <clears throat> well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, Interest is, is, is really big at academia in games, and one of the reasons Bart and I first started talking about this is there's a lot of, of people at Penn State, uh, professors, instructors, and so on, that are interested in games and using games in their, in their classroom or in their learning environments, but they're scattered. They're all over the place. There's some here, there's some there, and they're really not talking to each other. We thought, wouldn't it be neat if we could use the technologies that we have just to bring them together, if nothing else? to bring them together and have some synergy there. So there's a lot of interest there. There's a lot of interest across the country in games as well. Uh, business and industry is very interested in gaming. Um, you know, yeah. big corporations like Google, for example, are starting to look at applicants' resumes to see if they have gaming experience. And they're not looking at it to see if they're, you know, if they can hang out with them after work and play cool games. They're looking at gaming in terms of teamwork, uh, in terms of, you know, collaboration across distances where you might not be face to face. They're looking for those sorts of things. So businesses and industry are really interested in it, um, you know, as well as academia. So there, there's a number of opportunities out there for people, and especially students, that are gamers that might work out later on in their careers. Um, there's a number of projects already underway at Penn State. Uh, um, there's several going on here. There's, there's numerous ones all over the country. Uh, that have to do with educational games. Quest Atlantis is one, uh, which is really neat. There, there's just there's just a, a plethora of things out there that are happening in this space. So it kind of behooves Penn State to have at least one foot in that door to see what's going on and try to stay current with what's happening elsewhere. Um, Penn State had, does have a very solid technological infrastructure. And I know because I've been traveling to different uh, uh, Big Ten universities the last six months or so. And, or second to none, and some of you in this room, you know, you know, kudos to you because you're the ones that help make that happen. Um, there's definite research value and there's things I would have never thought of. Um, you know, one of the things we'll talk about later on is we've been talking with some music faculty about using Rock Band or Guitar Hero, which for those of you that may not be familiar with that, you actually strap on this play guitar and you have to, you know, hit, hit things in time to the music. Well, the music <coughs> faculty are looking at that in terms of getting people to understand basic rhythms and basic musical concepts I would have wouldn't have occurred to me and I'm a musician but, but it makes a lot of sense once they explain it to me. Um, so let me keep going. Oh I have a mystery man. He's gonna mic me. Thanks again. Um, you might have heard of them called serious games as well. And that's that's a term that came out yeah what around eight years ago in there's a lot of debate whether they should be called serious games or not. So, but you'll still hear that if you if you're looking on Google or whatever and you come across something called serious games, that's what this whole thing's about: it's games to teach, um, games designed for non-entertainment purposes as well. Um, and, and they can be used for a number of things. And games can be used for just basic awareness. Uh, they can be used for social change. There's one out there now called Ice, which is downloadable, and I think it something about I can it has to do with immigration and it has to do with the immigration laws and it's really designed to produce an affective change in the player so that you come in there and you know everyone thinks oh immigration laws yeah we don't think much about it. you get to take the role of a person that is an illegal immigrant and is being chased by the, the feds and you get to see what happens when you're detained and the conditions and all that and it, 
it does make you stop and think. So they're, they're used for that. Uh, they're being used for advertisement all the time. I mean, you know, movies come out with these little mini games they stick on. People that produce movies stick them on the web. Uh, all the TV shows now have these games and so on. They're being used to, to sell products, basically. And then, of course, education. And we're starting to see a lot of political games, too. So there, a lot of candidates are putting out specific games or trying to illustrate kind of their, uh, where their stance is and things like that. So that's going to continue, I'm sure, for the next year or so. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, the other thing that, that we do besides gaming with EGC is we do stuff with virtual worlds. And uh, virtual worlds like Second Life. And a lot of the candidates will go into Second Life and they'll do a presentation in there. They'll have a big, big presence in Second Life with avatars and so on. So um, we started looking around to see what else was happening in the CIC. And there's three institutions that we know of that have a fairly strong presence in this area. One's Michigan State University, the other one's Wisconsin, and uh, that better? Yes. <laughs> All right. And, and one interesting thing here to point out with Michigan State, they actually have a serious games master's de degree program. Uh, so Carnegie Mellon has an entertainment technology uh, master's program, and a lot of these are focused around kind of games and what's called media literacy uh, that involves games, video, the, the whole batch of media that we're dealing with today. And there's the MIT Educational Arcade as well, which has been around for I don't know how many years, five, five or six, years. at least five or six years. Um, so there are, you can see from this, this is a reflection of kind of what we're trying to do. There are some, some serious players in this space. And, and kind of the big thing that we're trying to do here is uh, at the institutional level. Most of these other organizations, these other universities, these are stuck within uh, PhD departments, master's degree departments. They're, they're kind of embedded within different groups on those campuses. So we feel we've taken a unique approach here in trying to do this at the central level to support everybody on campus versus being embedded with instructional systems or embedded within the College of Ed. Uh, so we feel our approach is a little unique. And again, the whole idea is to get these different disciplines talking to each other. We think because we sit outside a spe specific discipline, that will enable us to be better facilitators because we don't, we're not entrenched in one mindset from one, one college or, or department. So I talked about this, there's a disjointed community, there's really a lack of expertise in certain areas. Um, there are some, some places that have great ideas but they don't have the technical background to make the games. There's other places that have the technical background, the skill sets, they can call on students, but they might not have the design expertise. Um, so there's, <clears throat> there's these isolated pockets. And there really is, I mean, that's what the EGC is about, defining a program. I mean, we really don't have one at Penn State. And of course, there's lots of policy questions that go on. You know, one of the things that we're working on is a lab space, and we'll talk about that. But you know, what happens when someone gets injured in this lab if they're using a Wii where they're swinging stuff around? I mean, we have to worry about stuff that I didn't even thought about. So yeah, and even even consoles on the network can an Xbox authenticate a lot of these things that have come up that I would have never dreamed of. But uh, a lot of people here in this room are helping us work through right yeah, now. Yeah, we're all scratching our heads on a lot <laughs> of this stuff. So the solution is the educational game. Um, yeah, okay, so we, we had that here we began in July 2007. I think we really began before that, but that's when it was official. And we got word that, you know, spend some time on this and work it out. Um, and we want to promote and build, build awareness. Uh, we want to facilitate the use of the games. Uh, and uh, we want to build community and we want to assist in the design and the development of games. So one of the things we did in that area is, and he's not here today, but we hired, I don't think Jason's here. Uh, we actually hired a programmer, Jason Wolf, and he works down at ETS now. Um, he's uh, full time on the EGC project, and he came from a background of he was a, a not only a gamer, but he was a gaming programmer. He worked on Microsoft Golf and a couple other programs. So, um, very interesting fellow if you get a chance to meet him and talk to him. He has all sorts of great ideas, and he's really into mobile gaming. He actually has some patents out on some mobile gaming technology. So, it's an uh, interesting guy to work with. Well, and I mentioned the rest of us. So we have myself, we have Jason, and we have Chris Stubbs, and us sitting over here in the corner in Bart. And as you can see, um, my time's not on there. I'm about 60 to 70 percent. I try to work on it. Jason's full time, but Chris is 20 and Bart's 25. So we're trying to get a lot done with you know the resources that we have. And that's a challenge in and of itself. Um, we do have a steering committee. 
that consists of a number of people both within ETS and throughout the university. Pat Basong is, is uh, one multimedia developer down at ETS. Myself, Darla Lindbergh in Arch Arts and Architecture, who's really into uh, been interested in gaming and in gaming activities and game theory for a number of years. Um, Bart, as I mentioned, Mary Ramsey, who you all know is in the back of the room. Uh, couldn't do it without you, Mary, when it comes to the lab. She's been tremendous help. Uh, Brian Smith out of IST, who's, who's a, a big gamer, interested in gamer. If you've been to the, our symposium or something, you've seen pictures of him holding the guitar with Bart playing the guitar. So. And then Steve Thorne, who in liberal arts is uh, just a really big advocate of gaming and just has tons of ideas about using games for team building and language learning. And, and uh, if you ever get a chance to talk to Steve, make sure you have at least 45 minutes because once he starts, man, he'll just keep going. So good folks to work with. So I call these kind of like, even though there's four things listed here, I call these the three legs of, of the stool for the EGC. And the first one is this community hub, which uh, you could say, well, it's just a website, but it's really more than that because people can contribute to it. It's set up as a Drupal site, so people can come in there and they can have their own blog space if they want to, and they can write in there. Um, we, we can set up community events through there. We have a calendaring system and so on. A uh, number of blog spaces. This is where we'll, we'll publish uh, any of the games that, that we actually produce. We'll at least be able to get to them through this space. Uh, and, and, but I think the most important thing for the hub is this affiliate program, which is the next point there. And the affiliate program, again, you can look at it and say, well, it's just a database where people go and they fill out their information. Who I am, what my expertise is in gaming, what I'd like to do, that sort of thing. But that's the real simplistic view of the, the, the actual purpose of that is to bring these different people together. So I'm sitting here, I'm a professor in, say, education, and I have this really great idea for a game, but I really need to talk to somebody maybe over communication because it has those aspects. The idea is I can go to this affiliate program, which is a database, and go there and look, look up and find out, is there somebody in communications that has this expertise with action games that, that also might know you know, heaven forbid, might have some JavaScripting because I think I need that. And the idea then is you can find this match, you can get together and start to talk. How might we be involved at the EGC? Maybe not at all. I mean, it might just be that we're the facilitators or the catalyst to bring those two together. It might be that they want to come to us and try to flush some ideas out. And it might be that, that, that the ideas that they come out with and they run off on their own, they, they do. Or they might come back to us and say, we need your help to build this. And at that point, we get involved with, with Jason and maybe Chris and some other people and actually help conceptualize and stuff. And, and we have a Facebook group too that kind of started before our affiliate program started and we found people were using that in the same fashion. Via the Facebook group we had people in communications, <coughs> meeting people in IST that you know have similar interests that may have never never known that other person existed on campus. So we're trying to figure out ways uh, down the road how to integrate some Facebook features and things like that into this as well. Uh, the, the other big leg of the stool is, and it's consuming all my life right now, is a CGC lab. We have space over in 6A Findlay, which uh, was has some historical significance in that. It was, I guess it was the first microcomputer lab on campus when Gary Augustin opened it up in 87 or 88. So uh, it's an interesting space. But I have, I'll just show, oh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, then we have these engagement projects where we're right now it, it's kind of by invitation where we're, 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 we're looking at faculty that have been talking with us for a number of years or have a project or want to do something and what, what the idea is that we'll work with them and, and from start to finish get it conceptualized build it get it get it out the door and actually assess it um, and we're going to show one of those in a little bit uh, in fact we have Peter Dowu, who is here, Peter Razor can't believe it, everyone. Peter's our first engagement project for Eco Racer, so we're showing that a little bit. He actually brought to that brought that to us from Harrisburg. He had started it uh, and gotten to the point where his 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 uh, programmer slash student had left and <coughs> finished this thing off. So we, we took it. Um, we're, we're flushing it out, talking with Peter, and we've been meeting with him, and so on. Uh, and then we're doing events. I mean, this counts as an event, I guess. Uh, uh, Bart's organized a, a virtual world's brown bag lunch every about every month. Uh, we skipped this month, but then we do demonstrations and seminars. We've done. Uh, there was a National Gaming Library Day. Was it six weeks ago or something like that? Uh, we we went there. We set set up awful hot down in the basement, uh, but we set up rock band. We set up a whole bunch of things and for about five hours people just came and they played games and we talked to them and so on. So um, that's, that's the idea. Those are the legs of the stool. 
the website contains the database that I told you about. There's blogging. We'll put the projects up there. I'm not going to read through all these, but you can see the idea. The, the idea. This is we're trying to make this more of a Web2 website. It's not just some place where you go and look, you know, maybe every year and see if the information, you know, hope, hopefully it's been updated by someone. The idea is that the community will help build this site and help transform it and help keep it going. So the current projects we're working on, um, some of them are kind of no-brainer, no-brainers. PSU Jeopardy and PSU Hangman, which we keep trying a couple of diff different names for Hangman. But those were two games that were already pretty much in existence, and we just needed to take them and kind of bump them up the next level and get them out the door. I don't think they're the, they're the icing on the cake as far as what we're going to do, uh, but they are very good for a number of reasons. And one is they're easy for faculty to understand because they're the type of games when faculty think of games, they think of games like that. And the other thing is for faculty that are teaching you know, 200, 300 level courses where there's a lot of fact and, and uh, a concept acquisition that has to occur. Those type of games are great for after instruction, you know, drill and practice. They call it drill and kill. But the idea is you can go into these games and play them over and over. And, and if you you know you need to learn, uh, you know, the, the five major rivers in Saskatchewan or something, they're great for that sort of thing. Um, Eco Racer, we're, we're going to show and talk about in, in a little bit. But, but and I mentioned that's a game for alternative energy sources which is really cool. And then the other thing that I did mention before is, is we actually started before the game stuff, we actually started with virtual worlds. We have a, a, an active and growing presence in Second Life, which is you know, currently the biggie in virtual worlds, at least as far as educators. There's a lot of educators in that. Uh, and, and that space continues to grow. We have uh, a number of current engagement projects in them. Most of them have finished, but the faculty are kind of doing a round two, and I'm trying to help them out wherever I can. So we have, two, and this is really weird because I, I own two islands, but I have an island, Penn State Isle, Penn State Isle 2. Bart is, is coordinating uh, Iestania and Iestania 2. Uh, there's a faculty member that has uh, an island for Penn State Burke, and uh, Outreach slash World Campus has their own island now. So we have a a big grid. We're starting to form our own minor continent. And it should be interesting. Some of the things that some of the things that have come out of there, and some of the things that will come out of there in the future. Language learning again, something I'd never think of in virtual worlds. Gloria Clark down in Harrisburg, just going gangbusters with that. She's finding that her her students are more fluent verbally. They're writing more uh, in, for Spanish, uh, and they're actually able to experience Spanish life and Spanish architecture by visiting. Virtual Morocco and these different well not Morocco but um, um, there's some there's some other like virtual Mexico in those places so all sorts of things happen in this space. Um, Arts and Architecture has the Virtual Palma Museum in Second Life which they're going to roll out here in a couple of months officially it's built and I think it's pretty much ready to go but they have a big conference coming up and the idea is. Uh, people that come here will be able to either visit the Palmer Museum in person, or if they want to stay, I guess it'll be a different state, or they can visit it virtually in Second Life. It's not, it's not an exact replica, but if you look at the architecture of the Palmer Museum, you look at the architecture of Second Life, you'll immediately make a connection. It's got the columns and the brick and that kind of stuff. So, it's also very interesting that students are just finding this. Uh, so students that aren't involved in some of my classes or classes that are actually actively using Second Life as part of the experience, Penn State students are just finding us in this space. Uh, you know, Brett and I go in once in a while just to poke around and work on projects, and we'll have Penn State students come up and start talking to us in Second Life that are just, you know, they, they play in this space. They, they goof around here. It's almost like a Lego universe. You can build whatever you'd like here. And a lot of students just happen to stumble upon the Penn State space, which has been real interesting to see. And a lot, a lot of staff here in administration are stumbling onto the space too. Um, I just had was talking to someone the other day about it, you know would this be a good tool for uh, recruitment? And the answer is I think it would be. And not only that, you know the admissions office already has a space in the team version of Second Life, uh, and they have their own Penn State aisle, and they do run recruitment uh, events through there. So, so these things are happening. Uh, you know I've talked with you know. It's, it's kind of hit or miss, but there seems like every some article or something will come out about Second Life or Virtual Worlds, and the Bart line will be contacted for about three weeks, and we'll go and do these little things, and we'll talk about it. So people are people are interested in there. They're trying to get their heads around this 3D space and what it means. 
just to build too on what Brett was just talking about with the games, I think one of the other big challenges we have is trying to, to pair things properly. Um, people say gaming and education, and I think it's very easy to look at the whole field and say, well, you're trying to replace existing teaching with these games, and that's not really the goal. Something like Hangman, you know, for example, is really basic, but that is really good for, like Brett was saying, basic recall or things. You get into a rock band or even World of Warcraft is another game we're looking at using it for different purposes, language or music appreciation, whatever it may be. And, uh, Eco Racer is a great example of something that sort of fits in the middle. You know, it's, it's both uh, not quite commercial level high-end production, but it's still got that real fun element to it. Um, so there, there's a pretty wide scope of the things that we're looking at going into. And we're going to play this in a little bit, but we have a screenshot up here of Eco Racer. So you can see this is a 3D environment where you come in and you're able to set up your car and choose, choose the fuel source. And the idea is, as you're going down the track, you're switching between fuel sources because the sunlight might come out and you want to switch to solar power. It might get windy, so you want to switch to wind power and so on. And the idea there is by, by playing this game and seeing what the trade-offs are between the different energy, then Peter can, can actually have a, a, a debriefing moment with the students after they play the game. You know, it could be live face-to-face, -face, or we talked about you know using uh, discussion boards for that sort of activity. But the idea then is to get the students to, after the game is over, to reflect on what they did and try to come up with ideas for, you know, intelligent use of energy sources. Mentioned Hangman, like you can see, this is, this is kind of a, a no-brainer. But uh, like, like I said, we had we had 80% of the source code already, so we thought we would just finish it off. And again, the idea is that you can go in as an instructor and you can you can add your own words to this and so on. Um, talking about Penn State Isle, I kind of got ahead of myself when I started talking about that. But uh, so I'll skip that because I already talked about that. But here's some things that we're, 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 we're conceptualizing, trying to trying to think about. One is this thing called Palmer Mysteries, where um, we're looking at um, an exploratory. It, it might be GPS or it might be um, you know internal transmitters. I guess GPS won't reach into the building that well. But the idea is you can move around through the building and you'll have maybe an iPod or some other unit that will know where you are and can give you some information and uh, you know about the artwork or so on. And we want to tie that into some sort of game-like format so you're not just stumbling through there and oh yeah, that's interesting. But you have a goal in mind, so you're moving from place to place intelligently. Uh, Another one is Penn State Fantasy Sports. That's a, a Brian Smith, who's one of the steering committee members. He's been looking at that for a number of years uh, to teach statistics. I think it is, and, and basic, a couple other things. Basic statistics. Yeah, yeah. So, and that, that's kind of neat because you're not learning the stuff in abstract. You're learning it, and it makes some relevance. Oh, okay. I, I understand now. You know where this RBI index comes from and all that. So, uh, and then basic musicianship. Uh, We've been talking with some folks in the music department about rock band and, and Guitar Hero, and it's just amazing to me how quickly this technology changes because we were talking to them about this, and they said, this is really great, but we'd like to be able to input our own music into it. So, you know, they might want to, you know, put in a Chopin uh, medley or something. You know, it'd be kind of weird to do piano stuff on the guitar, but, but, but set that aside. The idea of them being able to customize it, and we're like, well, I don't think that's really possible. And then about two weeks later, there's big announcements. So you're going to be able to customize these environments. You're going to be able to put your own music into them. So uh, we're, we're starting to investigate that and see what the possibilities are there. Ian talked a little bit about the lab. It will be a CLC lab. so. Uh, if we were just building a lab for students to go to play, I wouldn't call it a lab. It would be kind of like uh, down at the University of Pittsburgh that, that Bart and Chris went to a couple weeks ago. And that's a four-fee thing in kind of their student union building. You know, students pay to go in there and play. If we were doing that, it, that, that to me just wouldn't, it wouldn't have any value. It wouldn't be justifiable. But the idea that this is a lab that when, it, when it's during open hours when faculty haven't reserved it, yeah, students can go in there and they can, you know, have fun and play. But the real purpose of the lab is so that instructors can reserve the lab for a couple of things. Number one, they could reserve it for teaching moments. Now, it's not going to be a huge space, so they might have to break them up in, into groups. But more importantly, I think the applied research and data collection. This could be a living lab where they could actually go in and do observations of students and cap capture empirical data off the computers. Uh, 
don't know about the consoles. That's one of the things we're trying to work on, whether we can capture stuff off them, but but definitely off their computers, so that you know they can they can get this data and they can start you know doing what faculty like to do, which is publish and and, and promote it and, and go to conferences and so on and demonstrate you know the type of learnings that are occurring in an empirically sound fashion. Because in academia, that's what it's all about. You can't just say you know this stuff's cool and I know my students are learning. You have to prove it. So. Uh, you're talking about the social use, and I think that will be a very interesting space too, because we've looked at a couple of different areas, like Pitt. Uh, there's one down in, is it Georgia, or that other one, and just tremendous student interest. I mean, they really come in, and then they start doing other things besides just playing games, and start talking to each other about coursework and so on. And, and there are some courses in IST, some courses in computer science, some courses in integrative arts where they teach a little bit about game creation, the concepts, as well as the technology. Uh, but what those students and instructors don't have right now is a lab that actually has the game prototyping tools available. So that's another goal here is to get a lot of these tools that faculty are already trying to teach these courses into the lab so they can then have their students reserve lab space to come in and actually work on game prototypes and things like that. And then at the end of that, we're trying to figure out, you know, can we somehow get a hold of those prototypes and push them out to the Penn State community and things like that and see if it's something that has some value and something that we want to continue pursuing. Question. Uh, I was going to ask, for the, the lab that you're setting up, do you have workstations for people who might be doing models for those games? So if you have someone who's perhaps a modeler, a scanner, like a, is there a workstation available in lab so that they can work on that, or would they take it from another lab and come in and work on the mod or the yeah. There, there will be eight computers in here, and they will be, uh, you know, CLC computers, so they'll have access to whatever software is available in, in, in other CLC labs. So, you know, I don't know if Maya is in there or not. Mayor, do you do you know? Brand if, computer, what they be? There'll be PCs. So anything that's on the CLC lab will be in those labs. Now, there right now we're looking at Dell Optiplex, which is the top thing, not the XPS, you know, gaming boxes. But we've uh, Jonathan Holmes tested them, and they, they run everything that we've we've looked at, you know, such as World of Warcraft and, and this sort of thing. Some of this high end graphic, but then we'll have a good, good graphics card. But whether they'll be able to do really super high end rendering, you know, you know, without waiting eight hours, I'm not sure. So. And you mentioned that the PCs that you had uh, a way to record are using like Fraps? Or yes, we have a site license now for Fraps. I haven't downloaded it, but I have it. And that was another interesting thing because this is a small company from Australia, and the only way you can buy it is through PayPal. So in order to get PayPal through the university system, that was interesting. Barb Smith, who I worked with, she wasn't happy with me. She had, to, she had to jump through some hoops to get that thing ordered. So actually, don't let me forget because I do have that. You probably want it on your machine, so I've got the site license for it. Just haven't downloaded it. So, in case there's a time limit, I'll download it. So, this is this is six uh, A Findlay, as we want it to look like. This is not how it looks now. But actually, when you come in Findlay, you come down the steps. You come down these steps here, and then you turn into the lab. This is a smaller room. There's a huge PC lab over in here. Um, what we want to do. And right now there's a door here and this wall is kind of crappy so I'd like what I'd like to do is knock this wall out and make it all glass or at least half glass with the opening in the middle. Whether we can do that or not, I don't know. But this first section here, this will be four PCs, four PCs, an L C D panel over both, um, with the idea that, that they can display from here on onto the over onto the L C D or my golden plan is if I can get this all the switching stuff taken care of is you can you can you could uh, push video content up from anywhere to anywhere. So we have video consoles or LCDs up here too. It would be nice to be able to push them out. And we also have a ceiling mounted projector that goes up to here. So um, again, those, that, that's the plan is to be able to push from anywhere to any, any output device. But whether we'll be able to do that or not, I don't know. Um, so you, we have this space here, and that's for community, and that's really for team-based games such as World of Warcraft or any of these Gears of War, any of these things where people may be collaborating together. And then this this is really more of a conceptual separation than it is a real one. What I'd like is some sort of beaded curtain that can be open and closed. And the idea behind that is not just so that we can separate these two spaces, but if someone is over here playing the Wii and they don't put the wrist strap on and let go, it doesn't fly over here and hit someone. So. That's that's part of the reason too. So there'll be a, there'll be a, this would be the PC area, and then this will be like the console area. 
where this will be the Wii area in here. Um, so the, Wii, the actual Wii would be here and the LCD will be here, but you know, a couple people could stand around here. So you need a lot of space for that because you're moving around and you're throwing stuff and so on. And then these other two areas would be the PS3 area and the Xbox area. And we won't have traditional chairs in here. We'll probably have beanbag chairs and maybe a couple of those game lockers that look like, you know, bad potato chips that sit on the floor. So it'll be a very non-traditional space in a lot of ways. And then we'll have, like I said, we'll have the LCDs and so on. And, you know, just the logistics that we're working through this have been a real eye opener for me. But like this wall doesn't have any power on it, so we're trying to figure out if we get power to it. And so <coughs> uh, our goal is to have this up and running by fall. And that's that's our goal. Any questions on this part of it? I mean, this is, there's a lot going on in this space. Mary and I meet every week and Bart, and a couple other people, and we always have lots of good questions for each other. Yeah. So. And as you could imagine, these devices, these meet, these are hot items. They could walk out of this lab very easily. So that's kind of where, what we're focusing on now, is how in the world are we going to secure these? Is there some sort of sign-out system we can use? Is there some sort of RFID chip we can put in these things? How in the world do you deal with Controllers, guitars, uh, the discs for the consoles. Will it be staffed? We're working with uh, Hank Moeller to have some of the CSS people help out with this, but we're still trying to sort out this sign out, yeah. sign in process. Uh, you know, we're hoping we we can work with Hank's group to, to help us with that. We're talking with the library uh, in a couple of weeks because they have a system already in place to do sign in and sign out of things. So. We're we're trying to cover all our bases and figure out what's going to work for us. Yeah, there is a there is a lab attendant that sits about here that monitors both spaces. So that that's that that would be the ideal thing. The library we want, and then Cole can please the director to test came up this wild idea, which just might be crazy enough to work. I don't know if, if you've traveled lately through airports, but they now have these huge vending machines that actually serve iPods and other media devices. And the idea he's he's working with, I guess, the bookstore is to figure out, could we put a device like that in where a student could put their ID card in, get the device out that they want the handheld controller, which is, they wouldn't be checking out a PlayStation, because they, they'll, they'll be in the locked down cabinets, but can they, can they check out a handheld controller, then when they're done, can they put it back into the machine through some sort of return slot and have it electronically acknowledge that they've done it? It's far-fetched, but if it would work, it would be great, because it would free up you know, people from having to be there all the time watching and seeing what's going on. And if, if it's tagged by their, from their ID card and they don't return it, we charge them. You know, just like you do at the library if they don't return a book. So, crazy idea, but it might be crazy enough to work. I don't know. So. so, we're we're done with what we called phase one, which really ran to the end of last year. Where we established our teams, we got the community <laughs> club up and running. Uh, we established the affiliate program. We really only have about a half a dozen or two, ten people in the affiliate program. So, so my 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 question or my request to you is, if you know faculty or you know staff that are interested in gaming, send them send them the send them to this site here. And have them sign up for the affiliate program. It's painless. It takes about five minutes. Doesn't cost them anything. And the idea is that we need to build that up to critical mass so people can start communicating with each other. And we're really in phase two right now, which is where we've done these presentations in the brown bags. Uh, as you can see, I'm trying to implement the affiliate program even as I speak to you. Uh, we're continuing the game development. We hope to have uh, the, the low level Jeopardy and Hanging and ready to go fairly soon. And we hope to beta, start beta testing Eco Racer uh, this summer. Uh, that's the plan. Lab we'll implementation we continue to work on, and of course the idea is to just deepen and expand connections with faculty and staff and, and students, because uh, I, I think students should be a big part of this overall process. Phase three, which is coming up all too soon for us, the lab will be functional. We'll continue to build the programs, uh, and we'll actually start some 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 formal engagement projects. So, you know, the project we have right now with Peter was more, much more informal and handshake. And, uh, it was a great thing, but we need to formalize the process a little bit so we, we can, uh, you know, so faculty know what, what they're going to get and, and we can get assessment data and so on. So, uh, and then I like that prototype environments and UP for possible statewide solutions. That sounds great. <laughs> 
so <coughs> again there's the sign up to get the affiliates and I think that's yep yeah, that's the last slide so questions comments Bart's kind of why why Bart's switching over here um, so we can get the game going and we're going to invite a few people up that actually want to play. Does anybody have any questions or anything? This might yeah. take a couple minutes to, to yeah. get loaded up. Sure. Um, one question that someone <coughs> mentioned to me about uh, XNA and Game Studio, whether or not you were going to roll that out. That, yeah, we are, uh, we are looking to become part of the X XNA Creators uh, Club which a lot of academic institutions are involved in now. So the goal is to have that on all eight of those workstations. Yeah, originally there was sort of a hope that we'd also be able to get involved in things like the, the SDK for the Wii and then the PS3, but that's a little bit pricier. Uh, and the Xbox makes the most sense because it's sort of a PC-based development uh, environment that you can push to the Xbox. So that'll probably be our test bed before we get involved in some of those other things too. What about some of the games out there that have no cost for for their uh, source kits. Like I think, well maybe it's only for mods, but I think what SDK for the source engine? We're working, yeah, we're working with uh, Valve software to have Steam as kind of the game management system, and all that comes with source comes with Steam as well. So if, if we can work with Valve and get that in place in the labs, the source engine will be available to yeah. mod and things like Counter-Strike and Portal and those types of games. The other authoring environments we're not so sure about right now. We're still looking into those. Valve seems to be the first one on the list because they have the authoring environment plus their whole game management platform, which alleviates us having to sign out CD, CDs for uh, PCs and things yeah, like that. Yeah, it's kind of like Steam is kind of like, uh, and you coined this one, it's like iTunes for games. You know, you, you get a subscription to, to them, you can just download the game to your computer and play it disclosely, which a lot of these games you have to insert the CD. So we're trying to get away from that on the PCs at least. We, Probably won't get away from that on the consoles, but at least on the PCs as much as possible. We're going to try to get away from that again to alleviate that human factor. Of, you know, I come in, I got to sign up, I got to check this disc out, I got to check it back, and that sort of thing. So, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. You know, what what kind of buy-in are you seeing from faculty with this? Are they um, buying into it? Are they are they think, are they not understanding how this applies to what they're teaching? Well, the faculty that we've been working with so far, I, I would call the innovators and early adopters. Right. So they're coming to us. I mean, they have been for a number of years. What we need to do right now is we need to get get our the three legs of our stool that I talked yeah. about. We need to get them into place. So as you move up that adoption curve, you go from the innovators and early adopters to, to the, or the the innovators, and you, and you go to the early majority, which is that upslope right. of, of the bell-shaped curve. That that would be our next target. Um, uh, those people that the, the, they call the early majority, when they most of them that I've talked to, when they think of gaming, they're very traditional. They think of Pac-Man. Right. They think of um, they think of Hangman and Jeopardy, which is one of the reasons why we want to have some of those in place, so that we have a starting point to talk right. with them. You know, we'll, 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 we won't come in and blow them away with here's this 80-hour game, you know, Gears of War or something like that. That you know, you, you're in there and you're engrossed and you're the soldier now. They, 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 their eyes just glaze over, they don't get it. So we need to, we need to baby steps. Right. I, guess I think one of the other things too, Jamie, is that people, the faculty that we've been working with, are coming at it from a lot of different angles. Sure. So for example, the music faculty that we've been working with, they aren't necessarily sold on the idea of games, but they see that games are really engaging people and they think, you know, maybe we can find a way to take advantage of that. There are people in uh, English literature, linguistics, who have a totally different approach. There are people in IST who think about the technical aspects, right. design, and, and how it, how working in teams virtually and things like that. So, yeah, I think it very much depends on who you're talking to uh, as to what their take generally is. Just yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would agree. And the other thing I'd like to add to that is one of the reasons I got involved with virtual worlds way before the gaming stuff here was because I was going to these uh, conferences and I was seeing people that were butching gaming engines because they wanted to get to the virtual worlds aspect. They weren't so much interested in the gaming aspect of it where you're running around shooting things. So they do, like they, they'd swap out the gun for a PDA this guy's running around with, you know. And, and so, okay. so there's another aspect there. So that ties into that whole, they're not looking at games for gaming's sake, they're looking at it for what they can get out of it. And the game is kind of the method to the madness, so to speak. I was just wondering if they saw it as something kind of silly and, and, and 
something like not I, so much as I something think, learning, but they think of it first yeah. as something that students are doing when they should be doing their homework or whatever. I think there are, and especially when we get to, into that early majority, the late right. majority for sure. Yeah. Okay. They're 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 going to be hard to convince, and that's why we need some convincing cases. We are working on. Uh, call it kind of a white paper about gaming and why, why gaming and that sort of thing. There's tons of stuff out there. We want to pull it together in Penn State, you know, explain why Penn State is so important. So. Can I add something to that? There are a lot of um, disciplines where, let's say like art or visual culture or art education, mm -hmm. or, or there are a lot of um, professional conferences that are paying attention to virtual worlds and things like that for, as a, from an educational standpoint and a cultural engagement standpoint and okay. sort of a postmodern education standpoint. So True. I think that may be where some other people are coming to and, and though they're viewing it through a different lens, that, that okay. sort of nugget of interest yeah. is definitely there. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, the other thing is we all know that the students are changing, the traditional stu incoming students are changing. And part of it is they are coming in as, as part of the gaming culture. So, and you know, that doesn't mean it's you're totally justifiable doing games just for that reason, right. but if it's a way to, to reach out to the students on, on, you know, in a method they understand, we should at least explore it and, and, and sure. see where it goes. Sure. So. All right, uh, do you have another question? Oh, well, I can sit here all day with questions. <laughs> I'll ask uh, one last one. Um, kind of uh, talk about mods and whether, I don't know whether or not you're gonna make that a, more available to Professor the Press. Uh, present that because that's a much cheaper, faster way to get through doing a small project. But uh, how about, um, and I always butcher the pronunciation, um, Machin Machinima? Machinima. 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 Yeah. I can never pronounce it correctly. <laughs> Type it, I can't pronounce it. Uh, are you advocating that use of gaming at all? Because it is a use of games still. I, I, if a faculty member came to me and said they wanted to use the lab or wanted to talk to us about doing that, I'd be all for that absolutely. Because it's not just, it's not just gaming; it's art as well. It's, it's you know personal expression. Some of the machine work is just out, outrageously great. So, yeah, I'd be all for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about ten minutes left. I just want to show you some things uh, with Eco Racer here, and hopefully, maybe after I run through it, if somebody wants to give it a whirl, that'd be great too. And uh, again, I need to put the disclaimer. I need to put the disclaimer on this. This is in still in beta, so what you see here very well can definitely change by the time it rolls out. We have it running through this Drupal site right now. So instructors or people can basically come in and create events. So if you have a class of 50, you can come in and create an event for your 50 students, and it shows up on this event page here. It's got open and closed dates, rankings, and things like that. This is an event that I created today, the ITS 500. So you come in here, you create your event, you click on Let's Race, and there's two versions here. There's a trial or an official. And the way we have this set up is you can run as many trials as you want, but once you run an official race, that data gets captured for your instructor to kind of look at and analyze and things like that. So the idea is you can practice as much as you want, but you only get one real official race that kind of gets tracked. They all get tracked. The official one is what we think the instructor's going to look at the most. So I'll jump into an official race here. And then this will launch the game that's installed. And there's a lot of blank screens uh, kind of with licenses and things right now. And this is kind of the control scheme, your typical WASD controls. And down here at the bottom, there's different energy sources. So depending on what the wind looks like, we have a wind gauge here, depending on what the sun's like. And these will change. This will spin faster if the wind's blowing faster. There will be clouds that come in and out on the sun. So depending on what your weather conditions are, you want to kind of swap in those energy sources based on the weather. And you're also in a race too, so everything is timed. There's a fuel gauge down here. It's kind of hard to see here on the screen in the lower right that'll track all your fuel. And uh, Dave Stong made us this, it's hard to see here in the top left. There's kind of a flower there, and that's kind of your emission readout. So if you go with combustion fuel, uh, fuel that puts out a lot of pollutants, that flower will start to wither, the petals will start to fall off and things like that. So it's imagery that, that Dave created for us to kind of, instead of just a basic emission report, we kind of add a little graphical element to it. And this is put together in a, a, a program called Game Studio that Peter uh, was working in when he came to us. You can see you're running on solar power right now. Yeah. Here in the lower part. Now look, there's clouds coming up on the screen. <laughs> so now so. I can switch to combustion. And you go a little faster here, a little harder to control. 
then you can switch back to sun, that'll slow you down a little bit, but it's not so bad on the environment. And we're in dev mode, so I can hit the button and see actual percents here. We're not sure if we're going to include the percents or not in the actual game, but right now it's a little easier when you kind of toggle on the percents here. You're getting better at this. Yeah, oh, I, had pra <laughs> I had some practice yeah. earlier. Yeah, he, he was when he first played. He always, first couple <laughs> times you play, you always run out of fuel. You just blow it. Yeah. And the object here is not actually to finish in the shortest amount of time. That's part of it, but the object is to do the least amount of, have the least amount of environmental impact. Mm -hmm. And then, so there's a real complicated formula we came up with for the scoring mechanism. And, and we're also working on a feedback piece right now. Uh, so you kind of get an idea just seeing the game, and we want to have an ability for players to come in here and actually click on their score and actually get some kind of plotted feedback. So a couple of graphs that actually plotted, say, the wind energy and plotted the sun energy, and also plotted, you know what they chose and when they chose it. So they can try and get a better idea of, you know, okay, I should have been using wind here instead of hydrogen, or, or be able to actually look at this and figure out, you know, why they made certain choices, well, how they could make better choices and things like that as they're playing through this. So does anybody want to give this a whirl? Any volunteers? Come on up. It's pretty simple. <laughs> Place an entire instructor with this. It's just to get people out, have fun, learn in a different way, uh, and create some conversation around it too. Peter, is there anything you want to add? That, uh, the car doesn't get destroyed. That takes all the fun out of the car. Take one of the side. Well, you can try. It's used to go by the side. I think that was the. Quite a lot of practice. <laughs> but yeah, as Chris said, you know, we're pitching this as a conversation starter. I mean, a lot of, almost like when online learning came about, a lot of faculty members, a lot of instructors were scared the computer's going to repl replace me in the class. This is more of a, it's, it's a conversation starter. You know, so you can assign students to play this for an upcoming module that you're talking about in your course. And you know, it, it, just, it, it just helps spark some dialogue, spark a conversation, and by no means, you know, it's a complete educational application here. It's just kind of a conversation starter, a way to get kids interested because kids are living in these game worlds now, and just another way to engage them and try and draw them in. So is the sun and the wind, is it consistent through each run or is it at random? The way we have it set up now is for each event it's consistent. So when, when I actually go in here to create an event, you can actually set wind parameters. and You can set a lot of these parameters as the instructor, and then the first time you race it, you'll see the pattern, and the pattern won't change for that event. That's something that we're figuring out whether we want to keep that the same or not, because we can randomize it very easily. So every time a kid races, it'll be different. Well, I was thinking if you, if it weren't consistent, you wouldn't really know if you're getting better or right. worse, and yeah. what effects changing have. Yes. Yeah. You wouldn't know if it's timing or mm -hmm. you know, dumb luck. So I think it's good that it's consistent. Yeah, and uh, kids are hyper competitive these days. Uh, so with the same thing, we felt that if, if you threw them different environments in the same event, it's not really that fair because uh, one kid might not have the, the same available energy sources during that race versus another student. So we're trying to make it uh, as fair as possible per event. And the other thing we talked about is this is an opportunity for students to actually collaborate with each other if, if it's the same for everyone. You know, two students might, might play, one might do really well, the other might do really poorly. The, the one that did poorly might, you know, this is an opportunity for them, like, the one that did well, and what did you do? And then they can talk about, well, I switched to wind energy here because the wind was really high. 
like, oh, okay. And then I started thinking about the wood stuff. And then it's an opportunity for Peter to engage them in the class situation and start talking about, you know, there's there's different areas of the, of the country that, uh, you know, are wood poor. We were talking about that yesterday. I never knew that. So there's, there's interesting opportunities to engage the students after the game, but it's relevant to them because, because they just gone through it. They, you know, it's not just wind energy. It's, oh, okay, I'm, I'm doing something. Yeah, and we, we have, we've thrown, this is version one, we have ideas enough for probably five versions of this game that'll pull in, you know, real data from AccuWeather to run tracks and different, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of ideas here. It's just a matter of implementing them, and we're just going to kind of go with the basic one first to see, you know, how it works with Peter students, how it works with other students, if people are playing it, and then go from there based on interest uh, to see if, how much we want to rev this game up. Any other questions or anything? Well, thanks everybody for coming. If you want to take a look at this game, by all means, email one of us. We can get you the, the website and get you in to, to test it and things like that. Because we're at the point now where we're going to start to look for feedback and try and sort out all the bugs before we put it out there. Thanks a lot. Thanks.